Um, welcome to lecture 5 for the course ECE 252B, Spring 2020. Uh, this lecture is being recorded on April 9th and is scheduled for uh, Monday, April 13th, 2020. It deals with Chapter 7 uh, of the textbook variations in fast adders. Basically, what we want to do in this chapter is to study alternatives to the carry look-ahead method for designing fast adders. Uh, we studied uh, basics of addition in chapter 5, carry look-ahead addition in chapter 6. So this chapter basically presents alternatives and also ties everything together with respect to adders. All miscellaneous topics that you have not covered. Chapter 8 will deal with uh, a multi-operand addition. That's basically when you have more than two numbers to add. So there are a bunch of techniques that we will study to be able to do that as, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So we'll see in this chapter that there are many methods besides uh, carry look ahead addition. Uh, the best design for any particular application context is technology dependent. And it's often a hybrid design rather than a pure design. We'll see how that works. And also at the very end, we'll talk about some optimizations based on timing of signals, arrival timing of uh, operands. Uh, so let's begin. By examining the simple idea of carry skip adders. Now, basically the, the terminology for different kinds of adders is the word carry followed by uh, a word that basically represents the method used. So we have carry look at adders, carry skip adders, and then we'll see a bunch of more, bunch more techniques later. Uh, now ripple carry adder is an exception. So some people actually call ripple carry adders, carry ripple adders, to be consistent with this uh, uh, nomenclature. So uh, there's always the word carry and then some word that represents the technique. So carry ripple, carry look ahead, carry skip are the things that we have studied or are about to study in this part. And then there are other uh, methods like carry select that we will see later. So what's the idea of carry skip addition? Uh, consider the top diagram in this slide, uh, which is a 16-bit adder drawn as basically 16. It's a, it's a ripple carry adder, but the bits are grouped into 4-bit blocks. And not that it changes the function of the adder. It's just a representation. So the first block is drawn in full. Uh, consisting of bits 0, 1, 2, and 3. And the other blocks are drawn as just boxes without showing the internal bits. So we saw that the latency of such a carry ripple adder is k, in this case 16, where the unit of measurement is the ripple time from one stage to the next. Okay, now consider the bottom diagram where a multiplexer is placed between consecutive blocks. And the role of that multiplexer is to allow carry to bypass or skip a block if it's going to propagate across that entire block. So for example, if the rightmost block consisting of bits 0, 1, 2, and 3 propagates the carry. Instead of uh, just waiting for the carry to propagate through 
those four stages, we provide this bypass path through the multiplexer. So the control signal for the multiplexer is P sub 0, 3. That means the propagate signal for block consisting of bits 0 through 3. So if that propagate signal is 1, meaning that all four stages inside that block propagate the carry. And in that case, we don't wait for C0 to propagate. We just allow C0 to go through the multiplexer and affect C4. Basically, C0 goes and becomes C4. Now, with this provision uh, of bypass paths around 4-bit blocks, the previously worst case carry propagation chain or critical path through this uh, adder is no longer from bit 0 to bit 16 because if the carry is going to propagate through all 16 stages it will actually go through the four multiplexers at the bottom. So if, if the delay of a multiplexer is say about the same as uh, carry ripple time from one stage to the next, instead of 16 stages, when carry propagates through all the 16 stages, we have just four stages, four units of time instead of 16. So that worst case path is now no longer the worst case path. The new worst case path in this adder is actually the following. So, if a carry is generated in position 0, because it's generated there, of course, it cannot bypass this block. So that carry goes to stage 1, to stage 2, stage 3. And I'm considering the worst case. So carry is generated in stage 0, goes to stage 1, 2, 3. Then it bypasses the next two blocks. And then it doesn't bypass this block. It simply goes into that block, propagates one, two, three, four stages, and affects the sum bit here. Because if it were to propagate through this block, it would take the bypass path. So that's not the slowest path. That's not the worst. So the worst case path for this particular adder starts in position zero, involves three ripples in that stage, then one, two, three multiplexers, and then three ripples here from position 12 to 13 to 14 to 15, and then it impacts the sum bit in position 15. That's the new worst case path. Instead of just being from C0 to C16, in the original ripple carry add. But still, this is better than the 16 stages. How many stages do we have here? Okay, carry generated here. So propagation would be 1, 2, 3, then 4 through this multiplexer, 5, 6. So 6 units of time up to here, up to C12, 7, eight, nine. So there are nine propagation stages. Of course, we still need the sum bit, but the sum bit generation, as I mentioned before, you know, occurs in every adder. So we don't have to consider that as part of the carry propagation latency. So we have nine stages instead of 16, which is an almost factor of two improvement. And this improvement is achieved with very little extra logic. So we basically have just four multiplexers at the bottom here, and four circuits to generate these block propagate signals. There are four of them. And each of these circuits is basically a four input AND gate, because the propagate signal for a four bit block is simply the logical AND of the propagate signals for the individual bit position. So with four four-input AND gates and four two-input multiplexers, 
we cut the latency of this adder to almost half, okay, which is basically a, a good trade-off. A little bit more cost, but uh, much less delay. So this is the idea of carry skip addition. There are a lot of variations to this. So why did I choose 4-bit blocks? Why not 5-bit or 6-bit? And so on. So we'll study those variations uh, next. So first, this analogy. So basically, these bypass paths for carry signals are analogous to when you want to drive on a one-way street that has a lot of intersections, each with a traffic light that can delay you a little bit. Those are basically ripple stages. If you want to go a long way, if the carry chain is fairly long, then instead of driving on the street, you may go on an adjacent parallel freeway where there are no traffic lights, so you can go faster. And then near the destination, you get off the freeway and maybe drive one or two or three blocks. So the freeway has on-ramp and off-ramp every four blocks, let's say, corresponding to four-bit uh, ripple carry blocks. So the signal, instead of going through the signal, the analog of the signal is a car here. Instead of going through the street and having uh, potentially to wait at every intersection, goes on the freeway, bypasses all those traffic lights, and then maybe just uh, have a few blocks of regular driving on the street. Okay, so this is the idea of carry skip addition. Now, this is at the bottom of this diagram, um, details of a carry skip for a 4-bit block. So you see within the 4-bit block, we have a carry ripple. So each two gates, an AND gate and an OR gate, represent a ripple stage. There are four of those. And then there's the multiplexer that allows bypass. And there is this AND gate that basically derives the control signal for the multiplexer. So the control signal for the multiplexer is basically the logical AND of these four propagate signals, P4J, P4J plus 1, P4J plus 2, and P4J plus 3. Then if you uh, cascade uh, four of these circuits, you get a 16-bit adder. And if you cascade uh, eight of these, you get a 32-bit adder. Now, in... The first edition of the textbook, <coughs> excuse me, in the first edition, this upper circuit was shown, and this is still used in some references. It's very similar to the bottom one, except that that multiplexer and the final OR gate, this OR gate and the multiplexer, are merged into this three input. OR gate. So it's a little bit less complex in terms of uh, circuitry. However, although the, in terms of logic, if you write the logic equation of the C4J plus 4, it will be exactly the same as the logic equation, it will be equivalent to this, the logic equation for this. So logically speaking, these two designs are identical. However, in practice, when you implement things in current uh, CMOS technology, what happens is that if you implement it as a top circuit, and say your previous uh, addition, so using this adder after a previous addition was performed, 
And that previous addition had carries of one in these intermediate stages. Those one values should be overwritten in the new addition. And that takes a long time. Okay? So even though if you if you start from a clean slate where this everything is zero at the beginning, then this top adder works exactly as the bottom adder. But if there was a previous addition that already set these carry signals to some values, those values have to be overwritten with new values in the new addition that you're performing. And in the worst case, that requires full propagation through all the stages of the adder. So it will be very slow. Okay, So you don't want to use this top design. This bottom design works correctly regardless of the technology used to implement uh, the adder. Okay, so here's an analysis of carry skip addition using fixed block size. Let's take the block size to be B, okay? In the previous example, the block size was four bits, but in general, it can be B bits. So we have B bit blocks, and if you want to build K bit, a K bit adder, there will be K over B blocks. Let's say K is divisible by B. Okay, so K over B is an integer. Then the critical path through this uh, carry network will start at bit zero. There will be ripple in the first block, so B minus one ripples. Then K over B minus one multiplexers. Then B minus one ripples in the last block. So the total uh, carry time, propagation time for this adder will be B minus one in the rightmost block, this first B minus one term. B minus one in the leftmost block. And then K over B minus one skips. And remember, we are assuming here for some simplicity that each skip, each multiplexer, has the same delay as one stage of carry ripple. So those are our units uh, of time measurement. So B minus one ripples, K over B minus one skips, B minus one ripples, so that simplifies to this expression. So you see here B, increasing B increasing increases this term two times B and reduces the second term K over B. Okay, so there may be a sweet spot where this expression is minimized. And in fact, you can determine that by differentiating with respect to B this expression, equating with zero, and B optimal. The optimal block width will be square root of K over two, and substituting that value in the T equation, the optimal time will be two square root of two K minus three. Now square root of two is roughly 1.4, so 1.4 times 2 is 2.8, so 2.8 square root of k. So the latency of this adder is proportional to square root of k if it's designed optimally. Uh, recall that the carry lookahead adder had logarithmic latency. Okay. So for large values of k, a logarithm, of course, is preferable to square root of k. But since we are dealing with adders that, that are not that, that wide, let's say 64-bit adder, square root of 64 is 8, and log base 2 of 64 is 6. Okay, so this can be quite competitive for adders that we use in practice. So square root of k is not much, difference from, much different from log k when k is not very large. Okay, an example at the bottom of the slide, if k, if you're building a 32-bit adder, then the optimum block width, square root of k over 2, 
will be 4 and the number of blocks will be 8 and the latency will be 13 stages. So 13 stages for a 32-bit adder that would require 32 stages uh, in carry ripple design. So less than less than half in this example. Okay. Now there's no good reason to limit ourselves to fixed width blocks. We can have blocks that have different widths. Uh, it's shown at the top of the slide with B0, B1, all the way up to B T minus one if we have T blocks. So what would be the advantage of having variable width blocks. Okay, that advantage is shown here. Remember, we said that in the fixed width block, this is the critical path. It always starts in block zero at the right, skips all the intermediate blocks, and ends in the leftmost block. Now, when, when the blocks have variable widths, then we don't know ahead of time which of these carry chains shown here will be the worst case. Only three are shown, but there, there are many more that I could draw. So, for example, the top chain is the one, as before, that starts in block zero, skips all the intermediate blocks, and then ends in block T minus one. The next carry chain is one that starts in block zero, skips everything up to here, and then it propagates inside BT minus two and affects the sum bit here. So it doesn't propagate across BT minus two. So this one skips one fewer block. Okay, for this reason, because it skips one fewer block, we can afford to make this block T minus two one unit wider because the propagation here has more time to complete given that it skipped one fewer block. Okay, and also if the carry starts here, if a carry chain starts here in B1, in block B1, then it ripples through block V1, then skips everything else, and then dissipates or ends in block T minus one. Again, this one skips one fewer block compared with that top carry chain. Therefore, this B1 can be made one bit wider. Okay, so basically, as we go in from the edges of this adder, each block will be one bit wider than the previous one. So if B0, let's say, is four bits wide, we can afford to make B1 five, bit, five bits wide, then the next one six bits. And similarly from the other end. Okay, so if this is four bits wide, this can be five bits, the six bits, and the two patterns meet in the middle. Okay, so here is the analysis for that. So blocks are B bits, B plus one bits, and so on, wide. And this sum is doubled because there's B here and B here. B plus one here, B plus one here, and so on. Until we get to the middle. Here I assume that T is even. Okay, so there are as many blocks going from left to right as from right to left that form an arithmetic progression, and then double that to get the total width. And that total width, we want to be k, we want to build a k-bit adder. And this gives us the value of b in terms of k and t. Okay, and the latency of this adder is easily derived to be two times b minus one, plus t minus one. Uh, so basically I'm taking this carry chain, uh, b minus one bits there, b minus one bits there. 
plus t minus 1 skips. Okay, now the latency of this other carry chain is exactly the same because it has one fewer skip and one more ripple. This one is the same because it has one fewer skip and one more ripple here. Okay, so that's the latency of the adder. And if you differentiate with respect to B and equate the result with zero, you get the optimal T number of blocks, two square root of K. And the optimal time for the adder is two square root of K minus two. Okay, recall that in the fixed width block case here, the latency was two times square root of 2k, and here is two times square root of k. So it's a factor of 1.4 better latency in this uh, variable with block uh, carry skip adder. Okay, so what do we lose? Uh, to gain this advantage in speed is regularity. Now the block widths are different, so if we are implementing this in VLSI, uh, you know, in the previous design, we can just lay out one block and just replicate the same design. Here we have to do a little bit more work because the different blocks have different widths. So it's not as regular as the previous one, but it does have a speed advantage. Okay, so this is basically an abstract drawing of carry skip addition, as we have discussed so far. There are blocks, possibly of varying widths, and there are there is skip logic, which are basically those multiplexers that allow carry to go around a block. And those skip logic circuits are controlled by signals coming from the blocks. Those are the dashed lines that you see. So basically, the propagate signals for the various positions in the block control whether or not to skip. So um, this on the right is a 4-bit block, so there are four propagate signals coming into the skip logic, and those are anded together and control the multiplexer. If this block is 6 bits wide, then six signals come in. They are anded together and control the skip logic and so on. Okay, so this is a sort of a simplified drawing of a carry skip adder that has four, six, uh, eight, then six, then four. So four plus six is 10, and 10 over here, that's 20, and this is eight, this is a 28 bit adder. Okay, and it has five blocks. Now the same idea can be extended to a second level of skip as you see here, if you have too many blocks so that even the skip path is quite long, so in this example, the worst skip path goes through five of these multiplexers, you can provide a second level skip path so that in case these three blocks are skipped, instead of going through three multiplexers, three skip logic circuits, we go through this one. And again, the control signal for this skip is ended with the control signal with this skip and ended with this one. If all three of those are skipped, then the signal goes through the second level circuit. Okay, so the analogy I showed you, this is a one-way street with traffic lights. This can be a major street with fewer traffic lights, and this can be a freeway with no traffic lights. So if you want to go a really long distance, then you go first from the uh, narrow street to a main street, which has fewer traffic lights, and then perhaps at some point to the freeway to get to the destination faster. 
So this is a two level skip. Notice that the second level skip is just one multiplexer skipping over those two. Uh, there is no skip over these two. So that's a design decision that we'll see how we derive at, at that decision. Sometimes we eliminate skip circuits if they don't help speed things up. So for example, if this block is pretty short, let's say one bit or two bits, and it turns out that the ripple carry latency through that block is either equal to or not much worse than going through the skip logic, then we may want to eliminate the skip logic to simplify the circuit. So in this example, again, we don't know about the details of this adder, how many bits there are, but if that's the case, and this skip logic here doesn't help much, we can remove it to simplify the circuit. And you see that this, this first level skip logic here is also eliminated. Okay, so how do we design a single level carry skip adder? So if I want, let's say, a 32-bit adder, then uh, I have to decide if, if it's fixed width block, I have to decide what the width of the block should be. If it's variable width, I use the analysis to find the best variable width blocks. But sometimes it's easier to go backwards instead of saying, okay, I want to design a 32-bit adder. I sort of uh, come up with a latency that is tolerable to me and then say, okay, what is the widest adder that I can build with that latency? So let's say the latency that I'm aiming for is eight units. And then I want to design a single level carry skip adder. So the last signal of this adder should be available at time unit eight. Carry in and inputs come in at time unit zero. Okay, now this skip logic here that you see S1, the, the rightmost S1 block has a control signal that comes into it. And the assumption in this design exercise is that I assume it takes one unit of time to compute G and P signals for the individual bits, and one unit of time to end those. So if this block has multiple bits, it takes one unit of time to compute the P and G signals for that block and then another unit of time to compute the logical end of the P signals. So the selection signal for the circuit is available at time two. And therefore I aim to produce the other input, the carry into the, the carry that's going to skip at time unit two. And therefore this block can be one bit wide if its output carry is to be available at time two. The reason that it can be one bit wide is that I, I devote one time unit at the very beginning to generate the P and G signals, so that's already lost. And I have just one unit of time left to produce this carry out, and therefore the block B0 can be only one bit wide. And then, so the, the, the time at which this carry is available is two. This one is three because it goes through this. And this one is four, this one is five, this one is six, this is seven, and this is eight. So I sketch this diagram. I still don't know what the widths of the blocks are going to be, except that B0 is one bit wide. What about B1? Well, B1 needs to produce its output at time unit three. Okay, again, one unit of time is lost to 
producing P and G signals. And then the G signal in this position, the rightmost position of block B1, has to ripple through two stages to get here. And therefore, B1 can be three bits wide. So one for B0, three for B1, four for B2, because its output needs to be available at time unit four. Now, once I get to blocks near the left, oops, a different constraint takes over. So here, basically, the constraint that was dominant was the, the need to produce the output at a particular time step. Okay. Now here, B3 has five units of time to produce its output, so it can be five bits wide if this were the only constraint. However, B3 receives its carry input at time unit four, and in case this carry does not bypass B3 and it's propagated inside, it has only four units of time to be properly propagated there if everything is to end by time unit 8. So B3 can be only four bits wide based on its input constraint. Based on its output constraint, it can be five bits wide. But if this carry that comes in at time 4 is to have time to propagate inside the block and affect the sum bits, including the most significant sum bit. It has only four time units to propagate. So that's why the blocks start getting shorter. So this can be four bits based on its input constraint. This can be three bits based on its input con constraint. This can be only two bits. And this can be just one bit. Okay, now these assumptions, you can argue with them. They're not really realistic that everything takes one unit of time. This is a good way to sort of get, get a hang of the idea of multi-level carry skip addition. Okay, I'll tell you later how these assumptions can be relaxed and replaced with more realistic assumptions. So if my single level carry skip adder is to have a latency of eight units, it can be 18 bits wide. That's the maximum width that I can have with eight units of latency. Okay, so if I were to build a 16 bit adder, then I can take this 18 bit adder and uh, remove some of the bits two of the bits to make it into a 16-bit adder. On the other hand, if I want to build a 32-bit adder, then this is inadequate. And I say, OK, what can I do with nine units of latency? If that doesn't work out, I say, what can I do with 10 units of latency? And then I do these trials until I get an adder that is 32 bits or wider. And then I have my design. Okay, so this is a generalized form of this example. The bits, instead of going from 1 to 4, uh, the block widths go from 1 to t over 2. And then the total width for any t will be t plus 1 squared over 4. Ignore the 2. It's roughly t plus 1 squared over 4. <clears throat> so for time unit t, my adder will be t plus 1 squared over 4 bits wide. So if I replace t with 8, uh, 8 plus 1 is 9. 9 squared is 81. 81 divided by 4. The floor of that is 20. 20 minus 2 is 18, which is the result I obtained at the top. OK, now if you want to design a two-level carry skip adder, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time here 
because in practice we we don't really design now the single level carry skip adder is attractive because it's uh, basically very simple in terms of hardware complexity and if you want to implement this on an FPGA basically an FPGA has these ripple carry blocks already available you have those where you can build them very easily on the FPGA and then you just have to provide these multiplexers and those multiplexers have basically simple wiring patterns so this multiplexer goes around this block there aren't a lot of long wires going from one side to the other so it makes it easy to implement so it's, it's basically VLSI friendly so to speak this design but once you go to two levels it becomes a little bit messy but just so, so you know that this is possible example 7.2 in the textbook Uh, shows you again here we want to design a two level carry skip adder with a total delay of eight so we start with the delay and see what is the widest adder that we can design okay so the idea is the same you start with the second level skips and then say okay input comes in at time zero the second level skip signal becomes available at time three with the assumptions shown here because the first level skip signal is available at time two, you need one more time unit to add several of those together to find this. So the timing at the second level is three for these signals, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then now you want to see what, can you, what you can do at the first level. So for example, here is a first level block BC, B sub C, with two constraints. The input arrives into it at time four, and the output must be ready at time five. So there is an input constraint. So if the total time is eight, this carry cam that comes in has only four time units to propagate in that block. And then that block should produce its output carry in five time units. Okay, so you are basically now faced with the problem of designing a single level carry skip adder with those input and output constraints. And this particular design leads to an adder that is 30 bits wide. So with the same latency of eight, that we could get an 18 bit adder with single level skips, we can get a 30 bit adder with two level skips. Okay, so this slide shows the idea. So you want to design a single level carry skip adder Given the input constraint, input delay alpha, and output delay beta, and then let's say gamma is the minimum of beta minus 1 and alpha. Okay, then the width of the height block in the single level carry skip adder is given by this expression minimum of beta minus gamma plus i plus one and alpha minus i and then each block therefore the width is determined from this expression and the sum of those block widths is the width of your adder so here you see sort of the an explanation of how did this uh, result was obtained. So the
output constraint is beta. In other words, this block should generate this carry out by time beta. So that carry out can start here and then skip these blocks. Or it can start here in B1 and then skip those blocks and so on. And similarly, for the input constraint, your input comes in at a particular time, then it will be it can be dissipated in this block, or it can skip this block and dissipate it in this block, and so on. And therefore, from the point of view of input constraint, B0 can be wider than B1 which can be wider than B2, because by the time you get to block B2, you have spent two time units skipping. But from the point of view of output constraints, it's just the opposite, OK? And the combination of these two constraints gives you the block width, which is defined in terms of this expression. OK, that's all I want to say uh, about multi-level carry skip adders. Of course, you can go to third level and fourth level, but in practice, these are not used. Now, to relax those simplifying assumptions that may not be realistic, that everything takes unit time, you can resort to a more realistic modeling scheme in which you actually build uh, blocks of various widths and measure or model through uh, realistic circuit simulation what these various latencies are for a B bit block. So I'm talking about, the, let's say, B equal to 5. For a 5 bit block, I have various parameters that I can measure or realistically model. And these parameters are the worst case inner carry propagation latency, basically a carry that starts inside the block and ends inside the block as a function of B. So if a B is 5, this will have a particular value. I can implement this block and measure this. G is a carry that is generated inside the block and goes out of the block. How long does that take? A is annihilate latency. If a carry that comes in, how long, what is the worst case propagation time until it reaches its end? E H of B is the latency of the H level skip signal for a B bit block. And S H B is the latency of the H level skip logic for a bit block. So I can measure these for different values of B and enter them in a table. So I will have tables that have these latencies for different block widths. Now, if I want to build a 32-bit adder, there are only a finite number of combinations for block widths. Okay. So for example, uh, inner blocks is, are always at least as wide as outer blocks. So uh, I can start uh, with a particular block length and then sort of exhaustively search through the design space with different block widths and derive the latency using my tables for each of those designs and then select the best one. On a computer, even many billions of combinations take only seconds to uh, evaluate, and then I get the optimal carry-skip adder, which sometimes has uh, counterintuitive block widths. Okay, you have you have weird block widths that don't correspond to intuition because you're doing this realistic uh, modeling scheme. Okay, the next topic is carry select 
adders. So carry select idea allows you to build wider adders from narrower ones. So for example, if you have k over 2 bit adders, whatever design inside doesn't matter. So you have k over 2 bit adders as building blocks. You can use three of these and a multiplexer to design a k bit adder. So the idea here is that uh, the two numbers that are k bits wide, the lower half of the two numbers are entered into this k over 2 bit adder and we find the sums and the carry out, which is basically the middle carry for the wider adder. Okay, now in the upper half of the addition, uh, we have to wait for this carry to become known before we can compute, but rather than wait, we sort of do two computations. Find the sum bits in these upper positions, assuming that the carry is zero, and assuming that the carry is one. So you do, compute two versions of those sum bits, and they're ready here. As soon as this carry C sub K over two is known, you use this multiplexer to select either the value that assumed carry will be zero, or the one that assumed carry will be one. So after the latency of these k over 2 bit adders, whatever that is, you just need a multiplexer delay to complete the addition process. So if the multiplexer delay is one unit of time, the latency of your k bit adder will be the latency of k over 2 bit adder plus one unit. So each doubling of the width of your adder increases the latency by one, which means that the latency will be logarithmic if you apply the scheme uh, multiple levels. Okay, so if you want to do it one more level, uh, here is a diagram. So here you have k over two bit, k over four bit adders as your building blocks. So let's say k over 4 is 8. So you have 8-bit adders, and you're trying to build a 32-bit adder, which is four times as wide. So you have four blocks. The rightmost block is just a simple adder always. The next block, so the first two blocks are basically copied from the previous slide. So you go from 8-bit to 16-bit using this multiplexer here. Now, in going from 16-bit to 32-bit, it's a little bit more tricky. So this CK over 2, the middle carry of your 32-bit adder, becomes known after the delay of the K over 4-bit adder, 8-bit adder, and then this multiplexer. Okay? Now, once that, that's known, you want to have two sets of results available for the upper K over 2 bits and just select one set or the other set, depending on the value of this intermediate carry, middle carry, okay? So here's how it's done. So you do two versions of this 8-bit blocks and two versions of this 8-bit blocks. So you now have the 8-bit sum bits conditional upon this carry, if it's zero, then these are the sum bits. If it's one, these are the sum bits. Similarly, these eight bits yield these sum bits if this carry is zero, and these sum bits if this carry is one. Okay? But I want to make, so th these two values, these two, are already conditional upon this middle carry that becomes known at this point. So that's why they go directly into the multiplexer. But these two values are conditional upon this carry, not this one. Okay? So you use the output of these adders to make these values conditional upon these. So basically you say, if this carry is 0, then this output carry will be something, 0 or 1. 
I don't know what, depends on the bits in the block. So I know this carry conditional upon this. So I use that to select one of these two. And similarly, this carry, which is basically the carry that you would have there if this middle carry were one, also selects one of these two. And then, so those are forwarded. So these two are basically some bits in these upper positions conditional upon this middle carry, not conditional upon the carry into that particular block. Okay, so that's why those extra multiplexers are used. And then at that point, so the latency of this adder is the latency of a k over 4 bit adder plus two levels of multiplexing. Okay, so here you see that the time for carry select adder of k bits is the time for k over 2 bits plus 1. And if you unroll this recurrence, uh, the latency will be logarithmic. Okay, the next adder that I will discuss is uh, something called conditional sum adder. A conditional sum adder is basically an extension of carry select adder to the extreme of going all the way to single bit adders. So dividing the width by half until we get to one. So this is a one bit, this diagram, logic diagram that you see on this slide is a one bit conditional sum adder. So there are two input bits, xi and yi. And this adder produces the sum and carry, assuming ci is 0. And sum and carry, assuming ci is 1. Okay, If ci is 0, we basically have a half adder. There's no carry in. So carry out is just the end of the two signals. And sum is the xor. If the carry in is equal to 1, then the sum is the complement of what you computed there. And the carry will be the logical OR of the two input signals. So this is a one bit conditional sum adder that produces the sum of xi and yi in position i under both conditions, where ci is equal to 0, these two outputs, or ci is equal to 1. And then these can be basically tied together repeatedly until you get to the desired width. So this is also a logarithmic time addition scheme. It's basically the same as uh, carry select, uh, carry to the extreme of going from 32 bits to 16 bits to 8 bits to 4 bits, to 2 bits, to 1 bit. At the 1 bit stage, this is your circuit. And you, you take two of these circuits and make a 2 bit adder out of it. Basically by connecting, uh, by using the carry from the other one, the other copy of this, to select either this set of signals or this. So if the carry from that stage into this one is 0, these will be sent out. Otherwise, these will be sent out. So this becomes uh, more clear if we look at this table of conditional sum addition for two 16-bit numbers shown at the top. So x and y are 16-bit numbers. Initially, we divide the two numbers into one-bit blocks so that these are basically the one bit blocks and compute the sum and carry in both cases where the block carry in is zero. So block carry in is zero and block carry in is one. So for example, if you look in this at this stage, uh, this one, the one one, the sum bit will be zero, carry out will be one. 
if carry in is zero. For the same stage one one, the sum bit will be equal to one and carry bit will be equal to one if the carry in is equal to one. Okay, so for each bit position, you find sum and carry under two conditions, carry in equal to zero, carry in is equal to one. Then you combine these one bit blocks into two bit blocks. Okay, so let me show you one of these combinations uh, as an example. So let's take the leftmost two bits, these two. Okay. If carry in into this two bit block is zero, then of course carry in into this block will be zero. So one zero is the appropriate choice for that position. And that carry of zero goes to the next position. Therefore, zero, zero. If the carry were one, I would have chosen this set. If the carry is zero, I choose this set. So now I have the sum bits for a two bit block and the carry out for that two bit block under two conditions. Carry in is zero. If the carry in is one, then I have zero, one in this first position, zero, one. And then carry of one goes into the next position. So I choose one, zero for the next position. So now the sum bits will be zero, one with carry out zero. They carry into this two bit block is zero. The sum bits will be one, zero. With the carry out zero, they carry into the two bit block is equal to one, okay? And then I combine two bit blocks into four bit blocks. So I'll do just one more step here. Okay, I say, uh, look at these two bit blocks. If they carry into this four bit block is zero, what happens? Well, sorry. If they carry into this four bit block is zero, therefore carry zero goes here. So I have zero, one, and zero, zero, one, and zero, and zero goes to the next block, and I have one, zero, zero. If the carry in to this block is one, the next row, then carry being one leads to choosing these values, one, one, zero, and then carry out being zero leads to these values being chosen. So now I have the sum bits and the carry out for four bits blocks, then eight bits, eight bits, then 16 bits. Okay, this, this slide is just further explanation of the same concept, so let me skip it. Now, adders that we built in practice for uh, microprocessors or for uh, custom-built circuit for special purpose applications are often hybrid designs. They're not pure carry locate designs. They're not pure uh, carry select design. They're not pure ripple carry design or uh, other designs, but the, often the best the optimal choice, uh, whatever criteria we use for optimality, okay, uh, complexity, latency, uh, energy consumption, and so on, often turns out to be hybrid. And here in this diagram, I've shown a hybrid adder that is a combination of carry look ahead at the top level and carry select at the second level. So this carry look at generator generates, so block P and G signals for these blocks are given to the look at carry generator. That look at carry generator generates these carries, carry into this block, carry into this block, carry into this block. Now as this look ahead carry generator does its work, it, it has some latency, okay? 
it needs some time to compute these carries. We have time to pre-compute two versions of the sum bits between these two carries, assuming that this carry will be 0 and assuming that this carry will be 1, and have them ready so that as soon as this carry becomes known, we select either the 0 version of the outputs or the 1 version. Okay, so the time for this carry select addition overlaps. If I design the adder just right, it takes exactly the same time to do these two computations as it does to find all these carries. And then after that, only a single multiplexer delay is needed to finish the process. Okay, now the adder, can you look at adder that we discussed last time is in fact one such design. This is from an AMD microprocessor. Uh, we are talking about the 64-bit adder. And uh, last time near the end of the lecture, we discussed this circuit, which consists of a bunch of blocks uh, called type A Manchester carry chain. At the, at the left edge, and a bunch of type E, type, type B Manchester carry chain. One of them, type B star, is a little bit different, it's a bit wider. So this circuit does not compute all the carries that we need for addition, but only selected carries. C0, of course, is known. C8, C16, C24, up to C56 are the carries. it computes. So only seven carries other than C0. Eight carries altogether. Okay, so what about the other carries? We need those for forming the sum bits. What about C23? It's not here. Okay, well this circuit is used in conjunction with 8-bit carry select adders. So as this circuit is doing its work and signals propagate through all these stages, 8-bit carry select adders are operating in these gaps. Okay, so the sum bits between position 16 and 23 are computed in two versions using Manchester carry chains. And then as soon as C16 becomes known, we select one of those two sets, okay? The sum bits between position 24 and 31 also are computed in two versions. As soon as C24 becomes known, we select. So basically, that the design is such that those carry select additions are done in parallel with this. They take uh, the same amount of time. So by the time these carries are known, we just have another multiplexer latency at the end of this design to compute all the sum bits. Okay, so this is really the bulk of the delay of the adder, this the circuit, because other than this, the carry select process goes in parallel with this, so it doesn't have additional latency, and we just have a multiplexer stage at the end to finish the process. So this is an example of a hybrid carry look ahead, carry select adder. Carry look ahead is used to compute these selected carries, and carry select is used to compute some bits between in, in these gaps, and then the multiplexer at the end of the carry select adder basically so selects the appropriate values. Now you can combine basically any two designs and come up with a hybrid adder design. And some of these are more useful, more practical than others. So here I've shown 16-bit carry look-ahead adder inside the three boxes. Only one of them has the details. The other two are just blank boxes. So I used 
three 16-bit carry located adders connected in cascade. So I'm using ripple carry between those stages, and I'm using carry look ahead inside. So this leads to a 48-bit adders using uh, three 16-bit fast adders. It's not a particularly good design because basically the delays of the three adders add up because they, they're sequentially connected. But this is just to show you, you can combine any two other designs into a hybrid. Other hybrid possibilities, carry select combined with ripple carry, hybrid, uh, ripple carry, carry select, and so on. And in fact, you can also combine three designs by going to more than two levels. Okay, so, so far we have talked about fast adders. There are some optimizations that you can do on top of what we have been discussing. Usually what looks best at the block diagram or gate level may not be best when the circuit level design is generated because the effects of wire lengths, uh, signal loading, uh, placement of various components, those, those all enter into the eventual delay and energy consumption. So in modern practice, optimization is done at the transistor level rather than gate level. We change things around so that we get the best possible design at the transistor level. We can have variable block carry look ahead adder. We talked about variable block uh, carry skip adder, but there's no reason that carry look ahead cannot have variable blocks if that leads to some optimization of the circuit at the transistor level. So instead of uh, uniformly using 4-bit blocks, as we did early on in the discussion of carry look-ahead adders, or 2-bit blocks, as we did for the parallel prefix adders, like Brent Kong and Kogi Stone, they use 2-bit two, two blocks. We can use maybe, you know, some 4-bit blocks, some 3-bit, some 2-bit blocks, mix them together, and perhaps that leads to a better latency or better energy consumption. And with design aids, we can explore a whole bunch of such designs and come up with the best uh, among them. Okay, we can also optimize for average or peak power consumption and stuff latency. Okay, there are some optimization called timing-based optimizations, and I'm going to explain this through an example. So, so far what we have done, we have computed the latency of the adders with our simplified models, of course. Assuming that all the inputs, carry in and the two operands, are provided at time zero, and we want to minimize the time t when the outputs become available. So all the inputs are provided at time zero simultaneously, and we want to minimize the latency. It turns out that in some applications, the inputs do not actually arrive at the same time. And the prime example is in multipliers. So we haven't discussed multipliers yet, but uh, let's take it for granted that when you, so a multiplier is basically some circuitry that generate uh, partial products. And then those partial products are added together in a carry safe form. Again, I haven't yet uh, described how multipliers are designed, but carry safe we discussed in redundant number representation. So a carry safe representation of the product is obtained. And then finally, the two components of that carry safe number must be added. That's where the adder comes in in order to find uh, the product. Now this reduction process from the partial products to the carry save representation is often 
uh, such that the bits of the operands to be added are obtained at different times. So here I've shown a 64-bit multiplier. And this example, again, uh, I can't explain why this is the case before we talk about multipliers. Bits uh, about 40 to all the way to the end are obtained after 15 XOR gate delay. So they're obtained later, whereas the less significant bits over here are obtained with less latency. So a couple of bits are obtained at the outset, at time zero. Uh, There's maybe two or three bits are obtained a little bit later after five XOR gate delays, then a few more bits after uh, six XOR gate delays, and so on. So the inputs do not all arrive at the same time. Therefore, by the time I have, let's say, the inputs in this range from about maybe 24 to 32, the bits from 24 to 32 arrive at this time, and I need that carry in into that position only at that time because even if I have it earlier, I can't make use of it until these bits become known, okay? So I have plenty of time in this part of the addition to obtain that carry. I don't really need to use the fastest possible addition process for this part because I don't need that carry at that, at that point, bit 24, let's say, until much later. Okay, so this allows me to uh, optimize the design, use less hardware for this part of the addition because I don't need a lot of speed there. I need a lot of speed here because once these bits are known, after 15 X OR gate delays, then I better quickly finish the addition, so I probably use the fastest carry look ahead addition for this part. But these earlier parts, I can afford to have more latency, okay? So this reference uh, from 1996 is where this idea was first discussed. Okay, from the authors of the same reference uh, where this idea came, here are here is a study of actual implementation of adders, uh, and uh, the outcome is shown on the energy delay plane, energy in picojoules, and delay in terms of units of FO4. That's fan out of four. An inverter with fan out of four latency is taken as the unit. And you see different adders of different profiles in terms of energy. And uh, in this particular study, conditional sum link adders and three-stage link adders, these are particular adders that were implemented in this study, show the best uh, profile. Um, so for example, if you take Let's say I want, I'm aiming for a latency of 9 FO4. Then these adders consume about 100 picojoules. These two adders would consume about maybe 150, 160 picojoules. And the, the plain Ling adder will have, uh, will use 600 picojoules. So, it's less energy efficient. Okay, this is a model uh, that nicely depicts all these trade-offs between adders. Uh, three parameters are shown in this design space. 
And the three parameters are number of logic levels in the design, log 2k plus L. Log 2k is the minimum possible that we can use. And L is basically the latency that we are willing to tolerate beyond that. So that additional latency can be 0, 1, 2, or 3 levels in this particular part of the design space. Then the fan out of gates is 2 to the f plus 1. So f being 0, that's 2, fan out of 2. Fan out of 3 is the next point in this space, 2 to the 1 plus 1. 2 to the 2 plus 1, fan out of 5. And 2 to the 3 plus 1, fan out of 9. And the third parameter is the number of wiring tracks. So, for example, in Kogi stone design, you notice that a lot of wires go sort of diagonally from one layer of the design to another layer. In order to route that those wires on a VLSI chip, we have to provide a number of tracks between those rows. And the number of tracks is 2 to the t. So 2 to the 0 is just one track. Here, 2 to the 1, 2 tracks, 2 to the 2, 4 tracks, 8 tracks. And then this design space, a bunch of adders are shown. So for example, Brent Kung has a high latency. Okay, but it requires the minimum number of wire tracks and minimum amount of fan, fan out. So it corresponds to this point in the design space. Kogi Stone, on the other hand, is the fastest. So the additional delay L is zero. But it requires a lot of uh, tracks for wiring. And it also doesn't have uh, the fan out problem. Fan out is minimum. And Sklansky is a particular type of adder that we haven't discussed. That one has basically uh, no problem with the uh, wire tracks. The wire tracks is minimum. And the additional latency is zero. But it requires a large fan out. Okay, so a bunch of other adders are shown here. And then in the particular paper where this uh, uh, taxonomy was presented, the authors pointed to this particular design over here. Okay, that design is sort of sits between all of the others that are shown here because it has a little bit of additional latency, one unit. It has a little bit more fan out, okay, three instead of two. And it has a little bit more uh, space requirement for wiring. Okay, so it, it's a, sort of uh, a trade-off between these various uh, uh, parameters. And could be optimal point for some implementations. The final topic uh, in this chapter is modular two operand addition. So if you want to add two numbers modulo to the k, you just do k bit addition, discard the carry out. I'm talking about unsigned numbers at this point. So ignoring carry out, which is worth to the k, is basically doing modulo to the k addition. If you want to do modulo to the k minus 1 addition, there's this interesting scheme. It says discard the carry out, but then reinsert it as carry in. In other words, use end around carry. Connect your carry out to carry in, because discarding the carry out is like getting rid of to the k units of value. Then adding in is like discarding to the k minus 1, which is basically modulo to the k minus 1. And then modulo to the k plus 1, 
also has a relatively simple implementation if you use what is known as diminished one representation. So residues modulo to the k plus one go from zero to two to the k. Therefore, they have k plus one bits. Instead of using k plus one bit values in the straightforward fashion, we devise a special representation for zero. This is called the diminished one representation. And then all the other values we reduce, diminish by one, so represent one as binary zero, represent two as binary one, and represent two to the k as binary two to the k minus one. So zero has this special representation that begins with one. All the others have representations that are diminished by one compared to their binary value. And then you can devise arithmetic operations that are fairly simple for this diminished one representation. So for example, if you want to do modulo to the k plus one addition, you need to detect whether x plus y is greater than or equal to to the k plus one. But that condition holds if and only if diminished representation of x plus the diminished representation of y plus one is greater than or equal to to the k. So you basically add these two values, these two representations, insert carry in equal to one, and just look at the carry out and that tells you whether the sum was greater than or equal to, to the k. Okay, uh, one final slide. Uh, to design a modular adder, so th those were special cases, okay? To the k, to the k minus one, to the k plus one. What about if I want to do modulo 13 addition? Okay, the code at the left, shows the definition of modulo m addition. If x plus y is greater than or equal to m, then the addition result is x plus y minus m. Otherwise, it is x plus y. So if you implement this directly, a naive implementation is that, okay, let's first find x plus y, get this number, then compare that number to m, to see whether uh, x plus y is greater than or equal to m, and then uh, subtract m if it is. So this is a three-stage process. Do the addition, compare to m, which is essentially as slow as an addition. You have to do a subtraction. And then check the sign of the result, and then do a subtraction at the end. So three stages. Uh, three additions, okay? Now this diagram shown on the right of the slide does this with much less delay by using more hardware. So we compute x plus y using this adder and x plus y minus m on this side. So we use a carry save addition to add the three numbers x, y, and negative m. So this has constant latency. Carries don't propagate. So we have the two values, x plus y and x plus y minus m, computed simultaneously. This one has a little bit more delay because we do the carry save addition. But then we look at the sign of this bit, the sign bit. If the sign bit is 0, means this value is positive. then we pick this as the output. If the sign bit is one, means this value is negative, then we pick this as the output. So the latency through this circuit is one addition, these two are in parallel, plus a carry save addition, which is constant time, plus this multiplexer. So it uses more hardware, because we do this two additions in parallel, we also have the carry save adder. Whereas here, the three additions, x plus y, then subtract m, check the sign, and then 
subtract n can be done uh, with a single adder. Okay, that's it. Uh, next time we'll talk about multi-operand addition. Uh, I have already assigned six of the twelve. Six, six of the students of the twelve have already been assigned research topics. Uh, the rest of you, please contact me with your top three choices, but make sure you don't include topics that have already been assigned because I want all of you to have distinct uh, research topics. So from the remaining topics that have not been assigned, please uh, indicate your top three choices, uh, number one, number two, number three, and I'll try to assign your top choice if possible, uh, then I move to second choice if not. And this will be first come, first serve basis. So if the same topic is a top choice of two students, the one who sent the choices earlier will get that topic. Okay? Of course, you can also propose your own topic, and one student has already done that, and I approved that topic. All right, thank you, and I'll see you in the next lecture.